You are listening to an exclusive interview on Bass Musician Magazine. The interview starts now. Hey everybody, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with bassist Mike Watt. It's great to have cool. you here. Thanks to the virtue of Skype, Mike's in California, and today... Libro. San Pedro. And we are in sunny Vancouver, Washington. Mike, tell us about your, your bass journey. You play with a ton of groups, but how did you actually get started? And we can kind of work through that. Yeah, I was a boy and I met this guy. I had just moved from the Navy housing here in Pedro to projects because my pop got stationed up in Alameda. My mom was like, no more moving. So we can't live in the Navy housing. We go to this project, meet this guy. I'm 12 years old. We go to his pad. The second day, first day I showed him my pad. Uh, second day we go to his pad. His mom says she played guitar. So she had him learn. And she said, you're going to have a band and you're going to be the bass. I didn't even know what a bass was, but uh, I guess every band needed one. I looked at some album covers. Ah, oh, it looks kind of like a guitar, just four strings. So I thought, oh, they just have skinnier necks. I didn't realize the strings were, you know, that was a couple years down the road. But yeah. So I started playing a four-string guitar with this guy, D. Boone. So I have to give credit to his mother. D. Boone, when I met him, he only knew one rock and roll band, Queen's Clearwater Revival. And he had all six records, right? I don't consider this one one record. No Tom, right? But I couldn't really hear what the bass was doing. You know, I can now. Stu Cook, he wrote some great parts and stuff. But, you know, when you're not, especially in those days, we're talking the early 70s. So I was looking at the album covers and uh, we got $5 stereo. Uh, there's, we don't you use the uh, record cover sleeves uh, to clean the mota, you know, there's no, so that they're on the hardwood floor, you, you know, five inches, uh, gallons of grape juice, I don't you know, six or seven quarters to keep it from skipping. I can't hear. So, but I'm looking at the album covers and I noticed the singer's got these, these shirts on, you know, and so I, I thought, wow, if I wear those, maybe a demon will still like me because I can't tell what this guy's playing. The next thing in the journey, besides just getting on the bass, was figuring out what to do with it. And it actually was, well, in the U.S. here, it was the R&B guys. I could hear James Jamerson, uh, Larry Graham. I mm -hmm. could hear. And part of it was actually the guitar men stepping back and playing little clip things and being really trebly and giving room, you know. I started realizing the records from overseas, like Cream, hey, rock and roll, the bass could be big. It didn't just have to be R&B. And in fact... All kinds of records, even bands like Kinks and Animals. Man, the bass was, I could hear it. John Entwistle and The Who, uh, Geezer Butler, Black Sabbath, Trevor Boulder with Bowie, and Andy Frazier with Free. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of bass. It's a huge influence. Then I came back and Alice, you know, gigs I was seeing with Dee Boone. First gig we saw together was T-Rex. That was kind of blurry. But Alice Cooper... Blue Oyster Cult, Joe Bouchard, Dennis Dunaway. I was picking up on their bass line. So these guys were really helping to inform me. Because we're talking early 70s. There's, there's Alfred's Guitar Method book. There's not a lot of, there's no instructional video. So a lot of this stuff, you know, you, you figured stuff out by trying to hear off records. Mm -hmm. Or even worse, like my case, I don't know why. I think if you sent in a dime, they sent you 10 of these. And then once a month, they were called 8-tracks. But man, if you missed the part, you had to wait till the thing came back. <laughs> now it was short because it was only like there's actually four tracks of stereo. So every 15 minutes or whether divide by four, you click on. So you'd have to. But man, with the record, at least you could go back. <laughs> so it was hard learning stuff with that stuff. The cassette was a little bit easier. Coming. But that's how you learn stuff. We didn't really have uh, older brothers and stuff. There was a guy named Roy Mendes Lopez. And he was way into flamenco and got it into Bach and Vivaldi. He showed D. Boone all kinds on the guitar. But the bass, of course, he did it with his thumb, right? He's doing this arpeggiated uh, hand technique. So his bass was the thumb thing. And so he could show me things. He was, he was a beautiful cat. He actually lived in his car. He was a hippie guy that really believed in it. His thing was practice, practice. Yeah, he wasn't a materialist. He was about if you're going to do something, you do it for love and, you know, kind of a... Uh, Altruistic. So if you don't express yourself with the uh, artistic things, then practice. Get at it. Us being kids, please show us how to play this song from this record. He'd give us a little hint on it. But then, you know, part of it's figuring it out yourself. Yeah, even tuning. We thought, we, you know, we would play Down on the Corner by Credence. And if that sounded good, we thought we were in tune. You know, mm -hmm. down, 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 down. Yeah, but we didn't know your Down on the Corner had to be his Down on the Corner. We, and, and, and Roy, you know, he kept these things mysterious for us on purpose, I think. Because we thought tuning was, 
you know, or not really tuning. We didn't relate it to the tension of the strings. We thought some people liked them loose, some people liked them tight. Yeah. So we didn't really relate. Now, you got to understand, too, we didn't know about clubs. All the gigs was arenas, and the sound was so bad, especially for the bass. When you see the pictures of all those amplifiers on stage, that's because the PA was mainly for the voice. And they had to power them kicks from this. So, mm -hmm. Really, really bad. So it, it was kind of tough. We found out about clubs and went. And you could actually be up there. And walk. I got to tell you, in the 10th grade, first week of school, you know, I, it's the first time I saw a bass with bass strings. I couldn't believe how big they were. It was like, well, no wonder there's just four of them. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I really, really, it blew me away. And this whole idea that it was some kind of a, there was hierarchy involved. There was politics. I'm not talking about the government so much. I'm talking about between people. This is where you put your retarded friend. Or, yeah. You know, it's kind of like right field and little league. Yeah. <laughs> like when nobody's going to hit the ball. Uh, this is before the movement. This is still an arena rock. No one really wanted to play this instrument. It's like dudes did it because no one, that's how you got a gig because no <laughs> one else wanted to do it. Luckily, I got into it because my friend and his mother wanted me there. And then this movement comes where everybody's kind of starting. So you're just as, you know, the, the, it's level play field. And so it really interested me to say, also they had funny clothes and funny names and they had a lot of funny stuff. It was pretty wide open. It was so crazy and so many people hated it that if you were into it, they let you come on board. Because maybe in SoCal, there was 200 people up in Hollywood doing this. Hmm. So this is where I really get to play in front of people. Before that, it's me and Dee Boone in the bedroom trying to copy songs off records. So it's kind of like building models. <laughs> Well, it kind of looks like the real thing. <laughs> it ain't. Mm -hmm. But with, it, with this movement, you can actually try this out. And even more than that, I know it sounds insane now because when I meet young people, they're writing songs right as soon as they pick up an instrument. But those days, no one we knew used music for expression. No one in San Pedro that we knew of wrote their own songs. Everybody copied. Everyone. Now, these crazy people in Hollywood who went up to Hollywood to do gigs, they did write their own songs. And you could tell they were just learning and it didn't matter. And so we got into this, wow, music can be not just to hang out with your buddy or to be a hobby where you try to build models. It can actually be a, a means of expression. You can like get things out of your mind or your heart or whatever. And so that was a huge change in my journey, learning how to express. You know, there's one thing about learning the alphabet. <laughs> And then learning words and spelling. Mm -hmm. But to write stories, you know, where you're trying to relate some or get or whatever, just let the freak flag fly. Whole different thing. So me and D Boone. Now I can't neglect those other years before we got involved. Mm -hmm. Because everything adds up to where you are now. Even when you play, you get your praxin for the next gig. <laughs> this way I looked at it. So I don't discount all that stuff, but man, was it Look, frustrating if somebody would just hip us to the fact, why don't you try? You know, and so that's why I always call, consider those days a movement. I never call it a style of music, a beats per minute or a dynamic. or That was always up to the band, even the clothes and all that. But this idea, we're just give it a chance. And they called it the funniest saying, you know, punk. Because in our town, that was a guy who slept with people in jail for cigarettes. We yeah. could not understand why they would call their music <laughs> But, and so this is what happens. We meet some other people in this movement. They, they want to record us and put out records. Uh, we get to play in our own town and then play in, you know, you know, SoCal's 150 towns, right? Mm -hmm. With no space between them. Start playing the other town. Then actually leave town and get in a van and play other people's towns. Then have to play other people's lands. First Mexico and Canada and then overseas and Europe and then even East. Last year I got to even go to China. That's basically what I've been doing since 12. It kind of plat plateaued out in, in some ways with, with D. Boone and when we got involved with the movement because we didn't really see, you know, even though I did, what, uh, 14 years of major label, 11 years of independent label, I have my own labels ever since. And it didn't seem like that was actually, that was just letting other people know about it more. Mm -hmm. Just by, what the ethics we learned by joining the movement and just learning how to express ourselves the same, that was kind of enough. I don't think having the privilege of hiring a manager or a, a publicity man or I don't think that increased kind of thing. In fact, I never did the uh, manager thing. I did hire some uh, publicity guys and I still do to let people know about stuff. Playing that kind of game, I don't know if that's so much a music part. And so I think the stuff that I learned there set me up just like learning how to write 
and speak as a younger dude, not bore people to death and make stuff interesting, but it's all vocabulary. I just add, okay, that's what I mean by plateau. It doesn't mean like I'm stuck in the doldrums. It just means, you know, when things, when you're first doing things, it seems the change is very quick. And then in profound things can happen, like you lose your man, like D. Boone killed in the van wreck. And man, you doubt yourself. Why should I even be doing this? But you just, the momentum keeps carrying you through. And so that's why I think I'm still traveling with the momentum of those old days without trying to be uh, sentimental or nostalgia about it. I'm not trying to say those were the best days ever, but they are partly why, probably why I'm talking to you now. <laughs> or the Bass Player Magazine people put me on there, or, you know, like, or I got to play with Stooges 125 months. Why I can, uh, just put together, you know, all, all this comes from those experiences. Like that. So I think it was very important. I think the journey in music is kind of good to talk about because I think we all have different ones. Mm -hmm. Just like we all have different thumbprints. And there's just no one way to do this or even know where it's going. You can kind of talk about where it came from, but that's kind of a guess. You can kind of talk about where you are now, but that's kind of a guess. For sure, the future is a guess. What I learned, autonomy is kind of important. But at the same time, especially the politics of bass, we look good making them look good. Kind of glue. Our instrument is very mysterious. It's still fine in itself. But we are good at putting things together. You know, and what's a glue without things to st stick together? You know, a puddle, right? We need the other cats. Now, I did... I mean, I still have a band with another bass. It's just two basses called Doze. So you can do that. Usually you need other cats. So you have to learn a, a certain kind of humility, even if it's your band, even if it's your opera and you wrote all the words and all the parts, you're still backing your own guys up. I like that. I don't think it's a bad thing. It's really interesting. So I'm forever grateful to D. Boone's mother for putting me on this machine. I didn't even know what it was. Isn't that a trip about life? Oh, totally. A lot of it's the right place at the right time. You know, you know the right person. Things just kind of, for those that I suppose think about how destiny might work. I mean, you know, if you hadn't have stayed behind and gone to Alameda instead, I mean, you know, things could be absolutely totally different. Or in the old days, a lot of people would say to me, "What well, you've done bass enough. Why don't you move on to guitar, or flute, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, or five strings. <laughs> Nothing against five strings. Nothing against three strings either. Yeah. Or one string. You know, but I think too, by hold my ground too. Mm -hmm. It's like what what are we can we do with this? Because you know, people ask me, I remember the bass player magazine, people asking me about the future of bass once. Oh yeah, six, eight, twelve, fifteen strings, of course. No, I said composition. I think the Maybe R and B started with some riffs, but a lot of times the bass is the last thing added. Okay, maybe not reggae or R and B. You know, they'll start with some riffs, but I'm talking about entire compositions. Where it's not just a riff. You put stop. I remember I just did this project a couple of years ago called uh, Big Walnuts Yonder, and I wrote these songs for this guy. And when they interviewed him, he said, "Yeah, Watt gave me some bass lines. I gave him all parts, man. They had verses, choruses, bridges, stops, starts." And he's a young man, and he. I didn't mean to like scold him or anything, but just the our instrument has just this weird kind of well, people are learning. I'm yeah. not saying that we're condemned to this kind of view, but they do have some kind of weird views. We can write too. Mm -hmm. I remember actually, I remember Chico Hamilton, a drummer man, and him making Chico Hamilton records and having song credits, and people drummers can't write songs. <laughs> So bass players, I really think there's something about, but but here's the way I look at it. If you're going to do that, realize maybe you're just going to be the launch pad. Maybe you're the springboard, and you don't know how that tune's going to develop. And actually, with people like Nels Klein, that's a great thing, because you set these guys up. Oh, yeah. You want that first take feel? <laughs> yeah, Nels, you only have to practice with the guy, man. He hears it the first time. So you're setting these guys up. And, and I think that's a very valuable thing that the bass guys can do because we are a little bit drummer. Mm -hmm. We are a little bit melody. We are the strange kind of thing that's still finding themselves. It's interesting. A lot of it, yeah, was discovered by Mr. Jamerson. Okay, we owe him so much. And I know hardly any of his tunes probably bass came first. He probably always heard the tune. You know, that whole session kind of work is so intense. You got to listen to the tune. You got to figure it out. You got to come up with a part and then you got to perform it. And everybody's there with their arms folded. They got that stuff done and they're just watching you sweat it out. That brother, he rose to the occasion. I mean, incredible. And coming from, and not caring, right? Okay, 
I'm not going to work this, the original daddy. Yeah. I'm going to buy this, what people at the time called a kazoo, a toy, right? <laughs> I read about Charlie Mingus, right? Yeah, I seen some guy from Lionel Hampton's band tried that. Actually, I think that guy played a stand-up through an amp, but whatever. I read this other story, too, uh, about him. Atlantic Records put him with uh, Stanley Clark. And so he wants to show St Stanley Clark take the A train. And Stanley's like, I don't need to know. I don't think Stanley would say that these days. In fact, I read this great quote. He said, anybody can play a bass solo. But what about a good bass line? It's respect. <laughs> Much respect. But anyway, this, this whole thing about what we are and where are we at. And then what about just cutting us out? Yeah, even more room in the boat. But mm -hmm. then I think of that poor, lonely kick drum nobody married just just beaten away all by itself and no glue no blankie no love yeah up there oh man so all this clatter there's there's something about what we do and there's something about the left and there's nothing wrong with the left hand of the keyboard but i always think of that the, the wedding song right dum dum da dum all the notes are exactly the same loudness yeah, <laughs> yeah. so th there's something interesting because our, our thing's a mule we're we're, we're this kind of hybrid the, we're the giant violin without the chin piece. <laughs> you know, I think that's why Leo called it the precision, right? But there's a guy from your parts now, I guess, from the 20s who actually had a fretted bass. This is coming out now. Oh, yeah. It, it's even before the Rickenbacker. And also mandolin orchestras had uh, fretted. And they were tuned in fourths, too, not fifths like mandolin. Oh, whatever. Leo called it precision. because He didn't play them anyway. I think he played a little piano. But it, you know what I mean? It's always been this kind of evolving thing that's been trying to be a, a a couple different things, you know. Actually, for me, it's a big thing. <laughs> but it's got many uh, dimensions to it. Our frequency is very small. Our range is really small, the way I see it. But it's in a good place, that little small place. Is. Yeah, because all those other places, when the band comes in, it disappears anyway. <laughs> they just hear you in the intro. Yeah. I remember Robert, you know, he had that band, uh, Infectious, uh, incredible. <laughs> you don't hear it. Because where we live is in that weird, trippy place. But uh, uh, it can be a, a very interesting place. Well, and uh, that, that ties in because, as you've mentioned, I mean, the, the evolution of the instruments, uh, probably the one you might be mentioning is, is Paul Tootmarks out of Seattle. Yes. His son is trying to get credit out. Yeah. Yeah. And we've actually seen that bass. We had a chance to go up with uh, fellow bassist Igor Saavedra and play one. And it, it was a real trip. It was interesting that Paul developed it for his wife to play. So the first bass was, was pickups on everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the pickups on like every instrument you can find. Absolutely. And the cable was permanently the permanently right. attached to it. You know, so it was like your radio or something. It was a part of the appliance and, and you plugged it in. So that said, though, it's, it's kind of interesting in the evolution with a new instrument. I always come to gear. What, how are you getting your sound with the, your, your choice? Because there are so many possibilities. What, what gives you your I, sound? I, well, hopefully some of it's my fingers. Oh, totally. Some of it's my choice in notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of it's my phrase. <laughs> but, uh, you know, from the early 90s, I found, I think it was in Santa Cruz in a shop, I found this speaker called Eden. Mm -hmm. It was a 210. And there was a 40 was the amp. Before that, man, I was trying everything. Oh, my God. First Minuteman amp was a PV400 with the 215s. I'm using a pig. And it's right. I, acoustic tries to make a comeback with a bi-amp thing. I don't know about bi-amp. You have to be about 10 miles away to really hear what it sounds like. <laughs> And, but I tried that. Then Firehose, right? I have to try another band with Edward from Ohio. And I try a Sherwin Vega, literally a half PA stack, you know, with the horn, folded horn and a 12, and then a top load bottom. Kind of heavy to bring around and, and also kind of a little honky, but I mean, I'm, I'm out there. And then, but with this Eden, the front ports in the tens, I don't know, it was a great combination. I could make them like fast attack in 15s. I could still get the bottom from the ports, but get the quick response and then he came out with some even better amps the wt800 and oh, that was a good amp it didn't have enough power really for gigs but the wt800 and then uh, four tens which was basically like his two ten the ones with the ports in the front mm -hmm. i think they were called dxlts and two of those the 110 pounds <laughs> right and then it's with, with the also the navigator uh, after that came the navigator preamp which was kind of like a bonus doubt 
the version of the front end of the WT-800 and his 1250 power amp, and I used those things for years. It didn't get in the way of the fingers and the phrasing, <laughs> choice, no, no sure. choices. It really, it really helped me. That was the first time I felt like equipment actually uh, helped me out. Besides, you know, actually the machine I'm playing, uh, as far as working strings and Fender. I, in those days, I think I was, I was playing a Fender Telecaster 68, which was actually a P-Bass, right, with a different name, because... P bass had changed, <laughs> but it's yeah. And I put EMGs in. It. Yeah, me and D Boone had a problem sweating really hard, and they sealed those things in epoxy. They didn't have too good of a sound. They were really harsh, but they didn't lose the high end halfway through the gig because they're sealed. In. That was a good idea. The problem was he had the. They, I think we're down to a beach here or somewhere. The, the guy who knows docking, I think, or somebody. He had the cable come in through the bottom, so if you pounded on him, it broke him off. At the, you know, a lot of this stuff comes from practicality in real life, you know, m mostly gigs. I did try a heavy mass bridge. Fender had something called the Claw. Kaler made for them. It made two pounds. It was like a boat anchor. Yeah. So maybe all this kind of went into it, too. But David Eden really helped me with that. Uh, 2003, I start playing with Stooges, and I'm doing festivals. And usually it's two SVTs stacked on each other. I've never played, right? They're just turned on full blast. <laughs> you No know, sound check. You just... And a lot of those, ooh, you couldn't tell what note you're playing sometimes. So blurry sound. I had better luck. Uh, England had these things called Laney's. Mm -hmm. They actually had eight power tubes. They were even more powerful. And they had a little more definition. But David went back and made another company called DNA. The stuff was getting too heavy for me. I'm sorry, Raul. <laughs> so I had to start going. He came out with these boxes, these 210 boxes that were great. They were only 50 pounds. One of the uh, thing, uh, advances, too, was the magnets. And the neodymium, mm -hmm. uh, quicker, too, and lighter. And they, these get, babies were bad, you know, 50 pounds each. But the amp was a little too heavy, so I went over to TC Electronic, Danish people. They had a 25-pound amp I got called the Blacksmith. But David came through with this DNA 1350. So I, I've gone back now to DNA amps. I did find a speaker box in England called Bareface, 40 pounds, two 12s, 1,200 watts. And I've only been playing a couple of weeks. I love it. I play with another DNA speakers coming tomorrow, 112. And so this is what I want to go with, three 12s and that three T50. And this is old man, uh, or less younger punk. <laughs> 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 you know, we're talking 40 pounds, 30 pounds, and... Actually, the case is heavier than the amp. So we're talking 100 pounds for the whole dealio, what one 410 was. Without compromising the sound, you know, and even getting more. And the whole thing is like stuff not getting in your way. You know, you want to make people feel they're at a gig. Bass guitar can do that. And and, and we're aiding a bed. You know, we, we're always responsible. We're not going to... Well, in a reggae band, you get to, <laughs> but other kinds of music, you got to be a little more responsible. <laughs> but you keep it tight and stuff, but you can make people feel like you know, I mean, the worst thing in the world is you get done playing and then they bring on the dance music and it's got way more punch than you. Oh my yeah. God. So we want to do this with the bass guitar. We can do this. We can uh, get and conspire with the kick drum there and really give uh, live gigs experience to people that, that I think is singular. And so that's the way I, I view the equipment. I, I tried the second opera, second man's mill stand. I did try to use devices, pedals. And in fact, I used six of them, right? Each, uh, there was nine parts. So sometimes they d uh, d uh, doubled up, but usually it was like, well, man, I did three tours with it, but I couldn't turn them on and off at the right time. And I'm not blaming the pedals, I'm blaming why. But uh, it's one of the reasons why I had an organ in that trio, because he could actually go lower. I was always afraid of losing the low end thing. So, but nowadays, you know, they tell me pedals, they have like uh, blends. You actually can run your straight sound and because in the old days, they would they tell you, well, you have one amp that does the dirty stuff and one amp that does the low end. And like, dude, we're talking about less younger. <laughs> I'll be schlepping. All these, but, you know, because I do do bass solos. The way I usually do a bass solo is you just play harder. <laughs> I know guitar guys, they have a button. They hit. I, I do work the knob more. I've learned to like start the gig maybe seven and a half. So you always got that place where you can go to. Also with the tone knob, seven and a half, eight. Six, maybe. And then judge on there. Because if you're always at the top, you've got no adjustments you can make. So I've learned to be a little more dynamic that way. Or like with that uh, bass James Williamson. <laughs> I ended up <laughs> had no controls. 
Well, as soon as I was throwing it and shit, so <laughs> it. But shit, everything was all full blast anyway. But I've learned to get a little more finesse on that, so I, I, I use those controls. I, there was a time in the 90s where I was experimenting with the onboard EQs, and then I experimented with by, uh, bypass switches. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like... Well, look, it's not engaged. It sounds better. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that should be not engaged, and this is engaged. <laughs> I know. Well, slow learner, you know. Well, you know, and also maybe the stuff I was using too. There's something about it on on board preamp. But what I was noticing, especially with recordings, sound getting very narrow. <laughs> There's something about the passive. So a lot of what I'm trying to get at, Raul, is like a lot of my stuff with gear. It's got to be tempered by reality. I'd like to overthrow the world with concept, but <laughs> you know what's better? Maybe you, you 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 arrive with the concept, but then you try it out with the reality and then keep your seat ship shape, you know? <laughs> right? You don't want to turn internal just because you think you got a righteous concept. <laughs> if I go in the middle of the ocean with my sailboat, I don't tell the wind where to blow. Well, I can try. <laughs> it's not gonna help. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I, I, I get these things, I bring them to the real world and then see how I'm dealing with it. Uh, the, or how the world's dealing with me. And then I try to adjust. The great thing is there's a lot of cats out there. And like guys like Leo Fender, who didn't play bass, or David Eden, right? Comes from PA companies. Sometimes these guys, they can make the breakthroughs because they don't know the rules that you're supposed to abide by. Because what happens is, I think, those rules, they came by for good reasons, but things change. And then people are afraid to go out there. And the guys who don't know what they're doing, of course, they have no fear. And so I think we always have to have that in the back of our mind. Not that it vetoes any other kind of rational thinking. I mean, everything, like I said before, vocabulary, it's all vocabulary. You don't have to forget one word to learn a new one. Actually, I'm starting to see it die down now, but this thing about fingers and pick, give me a break. I seen John Entwistle, this was with The Who, this was not the best bands, you know, Steinbergers and Overcoats. Half the states was his shit, though. And he used slapping pick fingers in the same tone, <laughs> whatever it takes. You know, it's all vocabulary. I remember this whole kind of thing about who's more manly or whatever, you know, why not get into ponytails and fanny packs, right? I mean, the whole thing gets kind of silly. To me, the end result, whatever it takes, man, and people have blown me away with, with what they've done or what they didn't do, we're here to learn. And the base, great classroom. What people are doing, it, and there's a lot of dudes. The, the question wasn't settled with uh, Leo Fender or James Jamerson. You know what I mean? It's it's all developing. It's really interesting to see how it's going and where it's going. I'm really intrigued by it. When the sites on the net, web I, I read about bass, and I, I just can't get enough. I get the, the, the zine and the thing, and all these people tripping on how we're going to make this thing, aid and abet, to make righteous music. Yeah. Without the other cats that ain't on me. And it is it is an ongoing process. That said, I know you've stayed so busy. You know, you do radio, you do you've got podcasts, you're 16, playing seventeen years. Wow. And you're playing with multiple groups. It's kind of a juggling act. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Th- there too. What what things do you have planned for the future? What last two operas I did and the trios I put together to realize those, those they they, they did it. Mission accomplished. So now I'm writing these guys their own albums, collections of songs. Big proj that they have to all focus on and realize it's more songs I wrote for them, collections of tunes, Missing Men, The Second Man. I have a band with two Italian guys that's kind of avant-garde. In fact, uh, I only write a third of the stuff. It's more of a collaboration. I found, uh, Raul, there's three ways to do it. You can have this idea and ask dudes to help realize it. I like the Stooges. You can be the side mouse and take the direction. And then there's the third way, the collaboration. Sort of like what I have with Dee Boone. He writes a song, I write a song. That's why I got going with these El uh, Sonia de Marnaio, these Italian guys. Even being 30 years older, 20, 25, yeah. doesn't matter. That's another great thing that's better than the old days. That doesn't matter that much in the old days. Uh, nowadays, old days, it was everything. Rock and roll is a young man. Whatever. Thank God that went out of style because, you know, it's ridiculous. It's all a coincidence when we run into each other. I think in those days, yeah, maybe, whatever. But that was more a culture as far as us as people's where we come and arrive and when we depart circumstance man yeah so let's let's, let's make it happen and, and get off those side tracks okay so i'm making an album with them in fact they want to do it in california so they're going to come here to record it i got like you said a lot of collaborations one neat thing about uh, our instrument if they want us we're there you know we can help them out and so i've been uh Doing a lot of things where uh, people have... Th- that's another great thing about these days that's not so lame. 
you coll collaborate with people over the internet by trading files. You could never do that in the old days. And so I, I've made albums with people I've never even met. And that, so I got a bunch of stuff like that coming. I do it all the time. Nice. I said earlier, when, whenever you play, you're practicing for the next time you play. So it's never wasted. Real prac actually is on somebody's record or at a gig. But you need those other pracs too. I guess it's a philosophical thing, you know. I hear this word rehearse. I've yet to hear a basketball player say, hey, I'm going to go down to the gym and rehearse some hoops. What's wrong with saying practice? I guess if you put on the outfit and you're in front of a mirror and, you, okay, you're rehearsing the gig. <laughs> but the other way, you're just running through the stuff. It's okay to call it practice. This whole kind of thing, what should be? Like that word normal. I like the word decent, you know, and being kind to people. But when I hear that word normal, man, whoa, <laughs> I buck up a little bit like Normal for what? <laughs> so it's the same thing with, with this too. What should be? What could be? What could be? Yeah. Should be. Could be. Yeah, just change a couple of letters. You're almost there. Could's better than should. <laughs> so I think if I put myself in more situations without being jive, I mean, they're truly different situations. If you're doing I Love Lucy reruns, <laughs> that's kind of vain thing. But if you're actually getting in the different classrooms, if you sincerely believe everyone's got something to teach you and you put yourself in those situations, you know, that's another thing about our physics, because we're low end and the wavelengths are really huge. Man, too many notes, we get tiny. Mm -hmm. So it's always a search for the right notes. So a guy just learned to write a pigeon bass line. Listen to those old talking head records when the lady's just learning how to play, right? Great lines. And then somebody sophisticated like Carol Kay coming from guitar and knowing all that harmony. Still, she's careful with her note selection. Incredible, what her, her sense of harmony, incredible. All these pe people on bass I look up to, they don't have to be the Meisters. They could have been somebody who won the lotto and just tumbled onto it. That's what I love about our machine in a way. Yeah, it's got built-in training wheels. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it is still, it's just like a blank page. Now what's to be done? What are you gonna write here? Here's the page, here's the pen. Well, not a lot of tools. A lot can get done with it, though. That's the way I look at the bass guitar. Really interesting the way. Well, I should say the bass, too, because there's something about the stand-up. In fact, what's his name? F Flowers. Uh, Herbie Flowers. He put both the Lou Reed song, Walk on the Wild Side. There's electric bass and stand-up on the same tune. Boom. Right? Oh, yeah. Right? Trippy harmony, you know, is beautiful. So it's, not to discount the double. I tried it in the 90s. I, I went and got a plywood one. I think a K. And man, it killed my... <laughs> it killed right here. Because I want to play it, this this thing. Oh. I tried. They even made a little 45 for Kill Rock Stars near your parts in Olympia. It was it beat, it beat me up. <laughs> Milt Jackson, I'm thinking of these guys, you know, the judge. And being an old guy and being able to wail on it. I'm not old guy, less young guy. Yeah, I can't believe how they did it. In fact, I heard James Jamerson, you know, it was like William Tell. <laughs> you shoot arrows with that. And, and I kind of like my action high, too. But not like that, but it hurts too much. But too low action is tough to dig in, man. There's something about bass to feel. And just to do this. But some dudes do it. I've seen it. Yeah. I, in fact, I've had someone was helping me carrying my bass, right? And they dropped it and broke the headstock off. Oh. Here, watch, don't worry. My, my bass guy will lend you his. And it was almost like you couldn't fit a piece of paper between the frets and strings. <laughs> this guy must have been, you know, they played like, you know, Braille. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. But uh, I need a little bit of action, you know, to, to kind of dig, dig her in yes. there. Talk about the bass. Think, yeah, because that that I did have to change. I'm not re recording. You know, recording, you're sitting down. It's on your knee. It's right here. Gigs. People don't really want to see you sitting down, so yes, Dan. <laughs> Man, late '90s, I couldn't hold the steering wheel. Well, I was playing a big old non-reverse Thunderbird, 34 mm -hmm. and a half inch, you know, nine-inch headstock. Right, this muscle was like about out to here in those days, and I'm right-handed. Just so I went to littler scale. The recording still, you know, big sitting down and all that big scale, but I had to go to smaller one. And so I started playing these Gibsons, but man, they were kind of muddy. So I had to like change them. I put pickups. For one thing, I didn't like the pickup either. I like it where P bass is gone. And then also that pickup is like this mud bucket. Yeah. So I changed all that kind of stuff up. Changed bridges on them. Got some of them had plastic saddles. 
you know, to get rid of any unwanted tone. <laughs> like, or chrome plus or, 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 or nylon. It was crazy, you know. Yeah. They were mainly a guitar company anyway. These guys started coming to my gigs. Well, Ronnie in the Reform Stooges was playing Reverend Guitars, this company out of Toledo. And these guys started coming to my gigs and taking measurements of my bass. We can make you a better bass. Also, the design guy had a cousin in Pedro. So that was my connection with this guy. And so, uh, okay, you could take measurements at this thing. And next tour, they come back here. What? Try it. So I'll play it for the gig. Whew. Fuck you very I mean, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I played. And uh, what, so what was wrong? So I give him a list. Come back the next tour with another one. And another one. And another one. And finally, a couple of years ago, was one like, whoa, I could play this. And it becomes the Watt Plower. So there's a, a Mike Watt signature bass. And I got to tell you, Raul, I would feel really jive to have something with my name on it that I wouldn't play. I remember being young, torn, more young, and seeing at the club the Budweiser poster. And those guys, whoever it is, man, they got a starving baby or something. <laughs> no, they ain't drinking that beer. <laughs> I don't want to be like that with the bass. I remember Thurston telling me about him and Lee's signature guitar. He said it was one conference call. <laughs> you know, there was a speaker on the table. And then when I just played with him last year, I said, why don't you play one of those Thurston? Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> so, you know my, your buddies are your teachers. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. It really would have felt job. And so I, and I got a cat into these cats working with me back and forth. David Eden, too, a little bit. I, actually, he... Let's me try out something for like watt proof, you know, because I'm very difficult with my uh, whatever technique sure. <laughs> style. <laughs> and uh, so it'll say watt tested. But I don't have as much uh, input there. There are features I like that I tell them about. It. But I li know a little more about the, the bass guitars. These guys, Joe and Ken, really worked with me. It was the dynamic going back and forth. Like seven, eight, nine prototypes. And I just thought, man, what kind of respect? Or something like this and uh so that's why i've been playing very cool and if i, I recall the bass i still have my 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 modified gibsons uh -huh. I, for recording i use my uh, uh larry graham the moon mm -hmm. and then also uh, my 56 <coughs> with thunderbird pickups i bought this for 200 bucks in the early 80s it didn't have some guy had carved out you know because they had the little pickup right so there's a big hole so the guy goes, you know, it's kind of fucked up, you know, hearing how most. But my mind, I'm thinking, you know what? I bet you a Thunderbird pickup is going to cover up that hole. And it did. And it's V-neck, you know, because it's 56. So it's, uh, I don't know. It, it records real. Both of these guys, they record so good. These are the ones I record with. I don't record with the little ones. Live, I don't think you hear the E string thing, but recording you do. There's a yeah. little difference with the E string uh, on recording. But live, you can't hear that nuance. And man, anything to have, you know, not be hurt. Right. The, the trick is to keep going. Sure. Right. If that means a littler scale, so be it. Oh, absolutely. And if I recall correctly, with your signature bass, you've got in the fretboard a little tribute <laughs> to your dad. There's an there's okay. a, there's an anchor on there. There was I was the last tour of my first opera, played in room with Nels Klein's Bob Lee. I was touring Cambridge, but the one in Massachusetts. And I'm loading out the stuff, and somebody hands me a necklace. I never even saw him. I just saw the hand. Maybe it was a lady. Maybe it was a man. I don't know. But the, the chain was there. So I got the box, right, speaker box. So I just take it. And then I started wearing it for good luck. And so obviously they picked up on because the first opera I used my father's story in the Navy as a parallel. Mm -hmm. to the Minuteman, so I can talk about losing D. Boone. And I lost him, too, right, around the same time. It was trippy, you know, how it is with your uh, parents, you know, and you're getting into some, some artistic, and they're like, oh, my God, you got to make a life. Don't be pissing in the wind, right? He knew it was something I did with D. Boone to be boys and with, you know. The, why, why are you, he's, he's killed. Why are you still doing this? So I start sending in postcards from tour. He doesn't realize I'm making a living off this. I went and got an electronics degree for him and stuff, but I'm actually making a living playing gigs. So I start sending him postcards. And this is where I get the idea for the first opera because he says, wow, you're like a sailor. Yeah. Actually, his people were, for, were from Arkansas, so he could not believe that I was touring in these parts because, you know, 
things were a little different in the older, more older days. And so uh, I said, oh, a little more loose step up. But, you know, we can go touring and I you know, play all these places. And uh, yeah, you're like a sailor. You go port to port. And that's where I, and oh, the boat is the van. And, you know, I made the big metaphor. And so that's kind of, and I think all these people have picked up on that. And, you know, my pop, you know, I'm the son of a sailor. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, no. it's, it, that, then so in a way that is, I'm not trying to say we're better than guys who go in airplanes or drive trucks or anything, but th there's some about boats and sailors. <laughs> Absolutely. And it kind of relates to this life, even though it's got a little more vaudeville, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's still, I can relate a lot to it. Now that I look, you think you're so much different than your pop, but in some ways I think as you get less young, whoa, maybe the differences are smaller than the things in common. And so that's what, in a way, that anchor. And it was their idea. It was the uh, Ken and Joe there. But I kind of flaunt it with this. and uh, But that was somebody else's idea. It's kind of like a team effort. Everybody like, hey, what? We want to help you acknowledge this Navy part. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm into it. Very cool. Never Very again cool. volunteer yourself. No, no. <laughs> you know, the acronym in AVY. <laughs> there you go. No, it's beautiful because a lot of that sensibility about pulling the duty, pulling the shift, being with your crew, right? The basic engine room thing was a boiler man, a fireman. You had to get the fire up. You had to boil the water and then you had to get it to the screw, the machine's mate. And so, you know, all this stuff went in to something that was very artistic in expression, but it was all nuts and bolts. My pop loved, he didn't even graduate high school, right? But he loved in the Navy, they trained, he ended up a teacher at the very end. They gave him a couple of years shore duty at the end in Monterey. But he liked the way things worked. And people come up in different situations. And it's not always academia. That don't mean they ain't aware and thinking about stuff. Same thing happened with our movement. Oh, you guys are all idiots. You spit on each other. And well, yeah, sometimes we get a little drunk. And we did that for a little while. Should have done that, maybe. You got to see the other sides do it. <laughs> you know? Luckily, my pop did see through that. Oh, man, the, the stuff that they told my pop in the 70s. And then I we had the big talk, right, in 77. And, the, like, we never talked about it again until those postcards. Wow. And then he finally saw me play. He only saw me play once. And he saw me get up there with the, the van I got from gigs, you know. And we played Fresno, where we retired to, where there's no ocean. <laughs> but anyway, it's an old spaghetti factory. So he sees me in, and uh, he set up the gear. He even lets us cock at his pad, man. And I could see. It wasn't verbal, but I could see, like, you know, it's okay. He ain't totally insane stuff. This is just another way of doing things. I, I think he could see parts of him, even though he had no music in his family or anything like that, or himself, except for listener. Part this, my, my, you're my son. Yeah, it was kind of bitching. Very but nice. I, I have to make a federal case out or anything. It just it came along. It, the no one was in the doing, as they say. <laughs> You know, and, and the sad thing was, yeah, the cancer got him and he didn't get to spend more time. And uh, but that's the way you get dealt a hand. Right. Same with D. Boone. You know, I, I've had to, losing people is the hardest lesson. I probably still haven't learned it, but it does make me a little more uh, earnest. Yes. Like we don't have forever. <laughs> so Let's get this stuff in. Like I'm not torn this year, 2018, maybe the first time since I'm back in D. Boone days. Because I want to compose and record. I want to do all these recordings. At least uh, three albums for my trios and then stuff I'm on with uh, collaborations with other people. It's just important for me. 60 is a trippy year. You know, you only do it once. You only do 61 once. You only do 59 once. <laughs> That's right. There's something about the 6-0, you know? I hear you. And uh, in fact, I went and did the gig up in the city. You know, I drove 400 miles. Even though I love Pedro, I thought, man, I'm going to do Celebrate 60 with a gig 400 miles north, right? There's not a lot of lady bosses in uh, that club racket. And so I thought it was just something good to do. Also, driving up there and driving back with my guys, talking music. And what a, you know, I never had a family rebel uh, kid. That was another thing. I had to kind of make a choice. I saw this with my pop being a sailor, never home. They had tours, right, of Vietnam in those days. And I was like, I can't do this to a kid. So I never... Uh, I had kids. So in a way, the guys, my bands, you know, it's, it's strong on them. So what a way to celebrate my 60th birthday, get to talk music with my guys for eight hours straight. They can go play your brains out. Then. <laughs> I, I don't get tired of it, even though it's been all this time. If you call a tour more than a month, uh, I've done 63 of them. You know, only 63 more. <laughs> well, And, you know, living in SoCal, I can play local gigs, seven to eight of them a month. 
there's just something about this I like. The knowing is in the doing. And if people want to know what you're up to, because again, you're a veritable windmill of all kinds of stuff going on, MikeWatt.com, is that a good place to check yeah, out? That's fun. Yeah, remember, the, the, one of the things of the movement, besides funny clothes, was fanzines. Actually, they're probably before even this this ethic where you just put it out. Well, I thought that's what the internet was going to be. We were all going to have our own website. We were all going to go to Fake Look or Shitter. You know, we were going to have our own fanzine, and nobody's in the. So that's how I got in on that early. So MikeWatt.com, that's what. People say you're webmaster. No, I guess I'm the web. I don't like that word, master. I'm the web guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm the web cat. So they, they can get info there. Well, it's been Got such it. a great in-depth view into your journey and your music and your gear and so much insight into our instrument. I think that so many people, and you're absolutely right, I talk to so many bassists, their journey is different. Everybody, there's no wrong way to do it. It's just going to go a different path and you might end up you know, who knows? They might end up on stage opening for you someday and got there a whole different way. And, and so, again, we appreciate you taking time to share all of this with us, folks. You've seen it here, an in-depth conversation with bassist Mike Watt coming to you live on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks for basing out with us here on BassMusicianMagazine.com.